staying in this medieval um, world, I wanted to ask a few more kind of detailed questions. Well, the first question actually is 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 about even within this this period of you know several hundred years, big period, we know more or less about it, about different different periods, different centuries. So, what's your feeling on the kind of um, the state of medieval music making at the moment in relation to say this subtilio period, which is later, or the earlier, the earlier repertoire about which we probably know even less, if 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 anything at all. Yeah, um, the, as I sort of spoke about before, the uh, the, the 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 difficulty uh, once the music. <laughs> so to speak, gets difficult, mm. um, gets intricate, um, all sorts of things start playing a role. I mean, it's like the, you know, the texts and the poetry uh, and the forms, mm. um, apart from the rhythms and everything else, uh, which are just technical uh, difficulties. But in, in terms of understanding what you're dealing with, um, yeah, you need an amount of, of uh, cultural uh, baggage mm -hmm. uh, that you don't learn in conservatory. Mm -hmm. you know? And unfortunately, you, mostly yeah. in the conservatives, they're not aware of this. Yeah? Sure. And so what happens and what has happened yeah, mostly so far, um, but of course, this is all you know, very much now uh, under, in development, um, is that you know, people refer to medieval music uh, you know, as earlier medieval music. So medieval music before... Uh, in fact, before organum or contemporary with organum, but not yet uh, formulated uh, in any uh, rhythmical way. Mm -hmm. um, and so these here we get the uh, Carmina Burana, here we get uh, Cantigas de Santa Maria, then we get uh, Hildegard von Bingen. Uh, and that music has become uh, wildly popular. Uh, but to my taste, all for the wrong reasons. Yeah, um, it's not so that that music is uh, unimportant. But the the main problem is that we have no idea what we are what we are dealing with, and um, and that is that is a problem because ultimately uh, music is language. The two things are just very 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 closely related, um, and. So if we're singing uh, Hildegard or or Alfonso El Sabio and the Cantigas, um, we do any what we do is based on some sort of folkloristic uh, intuition, uh, which mo more likely than not has nothing to do uh, with with the music that we are seeing. Plus that the notation is extremely imprecise. We have no idea about the rhythm. Um, as I said before, the likelihood that the whole thing was governed by a nice uh, bit of percussion, which goes pom, 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 pom. Um, that's all very, very, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so you create, you create a monster um, yeah, that is, is historically uh, completely insignificant. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I, I cannot do that. <laughs> I just... Uh, I, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. One other question that I would need to touch on um, is to do with um, the tuning of this music. So mm -hmm. this is quite a quite a specific question, and um, hopefully we can talk about it in a way that's intelligible and interesting for non-musicians mm -hmm. as well. Um, why does wh what is Pythagorean tuning? And why does this music from this period need that tuning system? Why does it sound better in that tuning system? Um, well, it's, this is actually very, a very simple uh, matter. Mm. Um, so there's nothing uh, mystical uh, or anything about it. Um, the Pythagorean tuning is based on pure fifths. It's just you, you start on the tone and you tune pure fifths yeah, in both directions. And that's how you find out where every uh, tone of the scale sits, mm. yeah? um, which is uh, different from how it sits on the piano, because the piano is uh, is what we call equally uh, is in equal temperament. 
uh, and so all these fifths have to be have been uh, slightly compressed in order that they will fit into uh, the octave, yeah, yep. five octaves later, mm -hmm. so to speak. So that's that's where the Pythagorean tuning um, is different, and so you get different intervals, mm -hmm. um, and this uh, tuning system works. Um, in such a way that, for example, uh, thirds, which we are used to as you know, considering a consonant interval, uh, so suddenly uh, thirds, major thirds, are not so consonant at all anymore. Um, because it's not based on a pure third, yeah, which is a certain interval that has, uh, that rings yeah, um, pure. Mm. Uh, the Pythagorean thirds doesn't do that at all. Except for in one uh, situation is that when it's combined yeah, with uh, a sixth, yeah, but of course we have to talk uh, in musical sure. uh, the terminology. Um, so if, you, if it's combined with a sixth and, uh, yeah, and so in a fundamental note, so like a sixth chord, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly um, this, 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 yeah, this, this third major third is too large. And the sixth above it, you know, which is also too large, you know, too wide, but making a perfect fourth with the third below it, mm -hmm. um, that uh, they that has a consonance of its own, mm -hmm. um, a, a very interesting yeah, sonority mm -hmm. that wants to explode yeah, or resolve into an octave and a fifth, which are just purely yeah. Yeah, purely constant intervals. So there is a different system of tension and release. Yes, and they, of course, empirically the they found it out. I yeah. mean, they were playing, they were tuning their instruments, let's say, <laughs> in this tuning, and they found out that that creates a situation of what we would call sort of a cadential uh, yeah, release yeah, from that chord into the octave and the fifth, which were the only real consonances considered. Yes. Then, yeah, and this is, was perfectly satisfactory for a long, long time. And it also means that your music is basically three, for three voices, three mm. parts. Yeah. Um, at some point there is a, yeah, why exactly we don't know, uh, but around 1420 there is a revolution and yeah, medieval music stops being medieval music it turns what then we what we call early renaissance and the the whole picture changes so the basis is not anymore these pure fifths but the basis becomes a pure third uh, and they suppose that it was under influence of english musicians who came to the continent and they had developed a repertoire based on pure thirds now the point is with the pure third um you can have you know, a consonant uh, triad, yeah, an interval of a fifth and a third, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds wonderful, mm -hmm. yeah, plus then an octave above. And so you get the, the picture becomes that instead of this sixth chord, yeah, mm -hmm. re this resolving into an octave and a fifth, uh, we get a triad. We get just yeah, a third and a fifth with mm -hmm. a pure third, um, which doesn't have to resolve anyway. It can be a final chord, it can be, but it becomes the basis of the harmony. And together with that, uh, then also the four part uh, texture becomes more common than the three part uh, texture. Yeah. Uh, of course, the two things overlap for a while uh, as, it, as it goes. And that's a pretty interesting, weird, strange period, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's sort of the early Dufay. Yeah. Um, and, and a group of composers that uh, that operates uh, in that time. Yeah. Related to this is is uh, another question which which musicologists and and musicians inter interested in this period seem to fight a lot about is the question of pitch. So we've spoken about the fact that in all the medieval iconography there are no instruments that you you think could remotely produce a sound lower than what's do c. An octave below middle C, yeah, at more the, or less at the most. At the most, yeah. Um, so there's no basic. There's no bass in this music. No. Um, what does that mean in terms of where where the music sits pitch wise? So, so this is the question. Like 
modern pitch is more or less at four a equals four forty. Like pianos are tuned that way, but all your recordings are much higher. A equals five hundred twenty three normally. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about your research into why the music sits in a higher place than than we're used to and than it does now. Um, yeah, this is all has to do with you know it's just empirical uh, uh, knowledge. Yeah. Um, you experiment. You you start working with instruments that are uh, the right size. Um, you look at the repertoire, and you see that okay, in most of the, in a substantial portion of the um, of the Trecento, you know, of the 14th century repertoire, be it Italian, be it French, um, that your top line, your cantus, is written in a soprano clef. Uh, and so basically it gives you some sort of a tessitura between uh, central C and uh, an octave above. Yeah, basically something like that. Tessitura just means range. Right? Yeah, the range of an octave. Yeah, maybe an octave and a, a tone. Yeah, not very much more. Mm. <coughs> uh, then you start working with a singer like Jill. <laughs> yeah, and they say, mm hmm, yeah. It's, uh, it's it's perfectly singable, but it's uh, it's not completely comfortable. Um, it would be nicer if it were a little bit higher. Mm. Um, yeah, so you find out if a little bit higher would be uh, would sound a little bit better. Um, so that's a that's an indication. So why you know, are all these top parts uh, apparently for some sort of a soprano voice? Mm. Um, but would it be in a tessitura that's not completely uh, as radiant you know, as you would like it to be? Yeah. Uh, that's odd. Yeah. Mm. Okay, then you start experimenting with your violas, with your harps, and with your recorders, and your organetto. And especially you know, in this uh, case, uh, with the recorder, um, if you are doubling a voice uh, with uh, a recorder, you have to be in the same register. And a voice doubled by a recorder is doubled by a tenor recorder because the recorder has a strange um, um, characteristic that it sounds an octave lower than it actually is. Mm. Yeah, and so you say, okay, now I'm going to accompany my uh, my voice. Uh, soprano partner mm -hmm. with my renaissance uh, tenor recorder and you say oh, this doesn't uh, this doesn't work because mm -hmm. the instrument sounds like an octave lower mm -hmm. uh, and in a completely different uh, sound world than the voice it doesn't sound like you're actually playing the same pitch right and it also doesn't sound like a, a cantus uh, it doesn't sound like a top voice yeah. instrument it sounds like a lower voice instrument mm -hmm. Uh, but it's the terminology that there is misleading because it's called a tenor recorder, but it has nothing to do with a tenor, mm. not in the music and not in the voices. Yes. And well, then I said, okay, let's make a, this tenor recorder in a higher pitch, like a third minor, third higher in 520, uh, and see what happens. And lo and behold, um, this instrument suddenly sounds uh, completely uh, different and becomes much more, uh, let's say, a, a carrying uh, of, a, of a vocal line uh, yes. instrument yeah. and doubles uh, a la perfection yeah, with the voice. Um, so that is, yeah, was some sort of further proof yeah, that that might be, yeah. And then there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, texts that you've you've found that describe the nature of kind of angelic high singing. Yeah, right? so that is you know, in the, the, the the few descriptions that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always refer to this music. Um, yeah, as being uh, bright, yeah, angelic, yeah, mm -hmm. high voices, girls, young young girls' voices. Yeah, which is the whole issue, of course, of who was singing this music. Um, were they men or were they women? But the point is, if they were men, uh, you have to uh, at least, it, yeah, you have to transpose it down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
some some groups they do that. Yeah, right? yeah. Of course, then you're out of any range of instruments, or you have to exclude the instruments. Yeah, but this is the point. Most of those solutions are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's you not have to get rid of the instruments because it's yeah singing so because well. it has to because it's written in the bass clef yeah. yeah, and that has nothing to do with pitch. That has to do with yeah you know, just transposition. Yeah. And there is plenty of proof yeah and description in the in the sources yeah you know, in the theor mm -hmm. theoretical sources about you know, transposing yeah you know, mi fa sol la yeah you know, and in, in theory utre mi fa sol can be anywhere yes yeah you, know, you just say it's ut but what it sounds like it doesn't it's the movable dough of completely the, yeah. yeah so it's i mean that's one of the things i love about playing this music is that it's so it's so flexible you need to be thinking you don't you know there's nothing fixed about where you start if you start in different places according to what you read according to what kind of singer you have um and transposition is a is like a big a big part of that um okay so music sits high it's in pythagorean tuning yeah so there's um, there's the aesthetics that you read there's the aesthetics that you see you know if you look at the paintings mm -hmm. at the miniatures you know, um illuminations of manuscripts etc the colors you know um look at the, the richer of the duc de berry yeah you know, who was one of the big promoters of this music mm -hmm. you know everything is bright and shining and yeah you know, and light um mm. has nothing to do with a dark and muddled sound of you know of three men you know singing no yeah so are you working on any medieval projects at the moment, or what? What are you working on? Um, of course, I'm, uh, I'm these days spending a lot of time on the on these editions, yes. uh, uh, which is a great uh, new activity. It's mm. one of those things that you, in theory, would have done for years, but it, a you need a lot of time on your hands, yeah. So you have to stop, you know, being connected to a conservatory and. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, I'm old enough to <laughs> to be there. Also, you you need a lot of accumulated knowledge and experience yeah, to, yeah. to really present something that you're convinced of. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so you're doing that with your friend Jos. Um, yeah, in, you know, making in, these in beautiful hiring. yeah additions, which uh, um, I recommend. Yeah, but p performance or recording wise, is there anything in your head that could happen? Um, so in my head, there are always yeah, there are always things that could happen. I, but you always wait for the moment uh, that it uh, that it happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Solange is a is one of the composers from Chantilly, as he is the, actually the main composer of Chantilly, uh, com a totally enigmatic uh, uh, figure. We don't know why his name is the name what it means, where it comes from, uh, where he came from, who he is. Um, all, all we know is that he is a, a, he's the main player, uh, if you like, in the Chantilly uh, manuscript. And that there are many villages named. Well, so, so I got, of course, uh, so we don't know anything. And of course, this plays uh, in your researcher's mind, it always is stuck there and then of course i've i've sort of recorded half of his compositions which are about 13 or so or 14 and you know apart from being the the the, the best represented composer in shanti he is i consider him probably also one of the the most unique mm. uh, there is something about the scope of his writing mm. Uh, which is sort of uh, out, uh, sort of outnumbers yeah. the others. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a certain consistency in his uh, scope mm -hmm. of scope more than anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's th these people stay in your brain. I mean, you cannot uh, really get rid of them. So I've, I'm still you know, thinking of. Yeah, completing the the complete works of Solage in terms of recording, um, and as part of that, uh, some a few years ago, uh, it was a it was something I did uh, a number of years before that. I went on a I'm a, I'm Dutch originally, so 
I go camping. <laughs> by default, by, by definition. By definition, <laughs> in, for a holiday, holidays means camping. Yeah. Hotels means work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got you. Um, but yeah, apart from that, so camping, um, so at some point I had a, I was heavily uh, studying Gaston Phoebus, who is one, you know, is another one of the key uh, political figure, figures uh, in the in the Ars Subtilior repertoire, mentioned in many songs, uh, mentioned many songs in Chantilly, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a very, very close uh, connection there. Uh, and so I started reading about uh, Febus and uh, there are a few very good biographies of him, although he's in the normal, normal history books, you've never heard about him. Uh, he lived in the, in the northern Pyrenees and has his realm there. Uh, extremely interesting uh, character. Mm. And um, so I read, and he had chateaus you know, all over the on the northern side of the Pyrenees. Mm. So I looked all these places up and said, okay, what's left of all these chateaus? Mm. And there are you know, about nine or so, or ten of them. Mm. And I said, to get in contact with this mm. figure, mm -hmm. uh, I said, okay, let's make a trip and uh, and go from one chateau to the other and see what's left and what what happened to them. So that was one. That was uh, before the that was, Solage. Yeah, yeah, that was before. It was like eventually. five years before that. Yeah. And um, with Solange, it went sort of differently. Uh, is that again? I was there in the in the Roussillon, which is on the eastern, the eastern uh, Pyrenees, uh, a little bit north of it. And uh, I was driving around there, and uh, so it's it's on the south. It's yeah. So it's the realm of Gaston Phoebus. Mm -hmm. Of course, on the other side of the Pyrenees lived uh, Juan of uh, Aragon, um, and they were in contact, and they were both yeah, musical uh, main players and, yeah. and in contact, uh, both in contact with Machot, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I was driving around, and suddenly I drive into a village, and it says Solage, yeah, and Solage written in the Catalan way, yeah, with T G. I said, "Oh, that's that's interesting. Mm. I've, I've never seen a name like that. Would that be <coughs> Solage? Mm. Would that be his name? Would that be the place where he comes from, the village? Mm. Because it could geographically, you know, that would be." A possibility close yeah. to Gaston Febus, to Foix, to you know, all the, the places. So I went uh, after that. I went back home, and that that also stuck. I said, "Solage, Solage." Are there more Solages? Um, and so I went very banal, ban banally. What would you say? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I went on Google Maps, you know, and I just typed in Solage, you know, yeah. all the Solages to be found. And yeah, what did I find that there are about between Solage, Soulage, Solage with an S at the end, you know, various spellings of the same word. Um, there were about 20 of them uh, and they were all in Auvergne. Yeah, so Auvergne is that region, the region just says north of where I found this Solace. Yeah. yeah, but it's sort of connected. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the remarkable fact is that the, the, the Duc de Berry, he was governor of Auvergne um, exactly in, those, in that period. Mm -hmm. And there's no other Solage uh, in the rest of France. Right. <laughs> So you went around all of these places. So we went camping around all these places, which was absolutely marvelous. Yeah, None of them uh, yielded you know, any concrete information like seeing his tombstone, which would, uh, of course, be very unlikely because it is a tombstone from 1390 or yeah, something, yeah. Yeah, so that that would be still there. <coughs> but, you know, um, it was striking right? that it was strictly limited to the Auvergne region. Mm. Um, so Solage writes yeah, an, a piece in honor of Jean Duc de Berry mm -hmm. with name and surname yeah, in the song. Mm -hmm. um, so is Berry is there, yeah, 
and there are all these solages. So it's very you know, probable that so this composer came from one of those villages yeah. called Solage, and he took that as his surname, which is completely a normal practice if you're looking for a pseudonym or a surname. So it that's that story. Very inspiring, and it's a, it's a great example of of um, you know, bringing together many curiosities and mm. feeding them into yeah. what might hopefully become a, At some a recording. Of, yeah. And just, just to wrap it up, Case, um, thanks so much for for everything and from com for coming to London from, oh, from where you live. It's been a great pleasure <laughs> because seeing Shakespeare, seeing yeah. a very great Indian music concert last yes. night, yes. Uh, it's all very, very, very worthwhile it's and been it's, it's being been friends great. <laughs> indeed yes so just tell just tell us finally um a little bit about the music we're going to play on wednesday uh the two of us in uh st mary's church which is just next door here to sans right. film studio yeah um yeah so it's uh another attempt at uh, minimal <laughs> minimal music uh, in another in another sense, um, even less than with Jill, because there you had three sounds. Well, I had a, yeah, I had a recorder and I had the fiddle. So Here now we, we just, are just trying to uh, make music with just the fiddle. It's very exposing just to play duo, right? It is. It's, it's yeah. very intimate. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we are. So we're playing medieval music, yeah, as we've been talking a lot about medieval music. Uh, and we don't know about instrumental music, in medieval, you know, apart from those infamous estampitas, mm -hmm. which ultimately I've decided are probably for a band rather than for a solo instrument or even a duo. Mm. Um, so we have to... Uh, there are bits and scraps of uh, of repertoire that you have to uh, find, mm. uh, which which could be uh, instrumental, um, or that are so based apparently on instrumental music, although they are songs mm. uh, with a text uh, that you could say, okay, it's uh, it, it would be a valid uh, yeah. thing to play just uh, with the instruments. Yeah. Mm. And not a mortal sin uh, to remove the text. Like huh? yeah, to remove the, the text, problem of yeah. playing, yeah, t texted music just yes. instrumentally is that uh, you feel very strongly that you, you miss you miss the words. Yeah, unless yeah the music itself yeah speaks enough or it has enough uh, meaning yeah. um, significance, mm. uh, and so the the structure of the program is basically. Um, are, are pieces by Machaut because Machaut is a is a hero, my hero, mm -hmm. one of my heroes, um, and uh, he has written, written a number of monodic uh, uh, virelais. Uh, virelais is a, a musical form, and they're they're very short pieces, you know, very brief. Uh, but of course, you repeat the text, and mm -hmm. so they become longer as you spin out. Uh, more text. His own uh, poems. Huh? His own poems, right? And there is, of course, his own poems. Um, and uh, the one, a number of these virelais are very clearly based on a drone. Yeah, so it means on a, on a lying uh, fifth uh, in an inst in some instrument. You know, and then you see, of course, the parallels with, uh, like the concert we heard yesterday, uh, the whole, that whole repertoire from India just built on based on just the fifth that's lying down and everything uh, takes off from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not to say that you know, that my show is uh, Indian music but um, but that aspect um, is somehow you know, leaked through you know, mm -hmm. into Western music. I believe, you know, it's a, it's again, it's a language, a language thing, and we are still susceptible to the effect of that. Uh, I think the fact that we are, uh, that comes from there. It's mm -hmm. like the Indo, Indo-European languages. Yeah. We took that over. Yeah, we took that. The feeling of the the feeling of the fifth of and fifth this the creating drone. the dissonance uh, against a drone yeah. uh, is something that filtered uh, 
through into our music. There's no no two ways about it. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, so we have we play five of these violins, mm -hmm. yeah, with drone, and uh, and then in between are uh, various instrumental. Um, Pieces, yeah. Some of them are really uh, written as instrumental pieces, yeah, and some are uh, pieces where we just don't have the text, yeah, or they're uh, texted pieces where we have just omitted uh, omitted the text. Um, partially French, partially Italian, and uh, partially very virtuosic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the mashup pieces are unbelievably simple. Yeah, the the uh, the art of just condensing such a specific special feeling in just a handful of notes, yes. sort of uncanny yeah. skill that he has in doing that. Yeah, um, that's really exciting, uh, or possibly challenging to listen to. Cause it's so simple, but must be not you know it's not easy to write music like that. Not e not easy. No, it? and then not one piece, but yeah. he does it <laughs> again and again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's the a power of melodic writing. Uh, yeah. That where the, he is, he stands out uh, yeah. from uh, anybody else. So uh, Olivier here at Sands um, is very kindly filming the concert and recording it. So um, we'd like to invite everyone to to watch it online and to to come to the concert on on Wednesday. And thank you so much, Case. Thank really you, Fred, for this idea. Uh, it was very, very great. Great. Thank you.